Hello. 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 All right. Yeah. Hello. It sounds like it works now. That's where it comes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. I knew Jen might not make it, but Keith and Tony do. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Then I guess this is probably everything. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I think we can get started then. So um, today's speaker is Ryan Janik. Uh, Ryan did his PhD in Berkeley and then now postdoc at Fermilab, where he's part of the SQMS collaboration. Um, and today he's going to tell us about some new ideas for like trying to do all experiments. So go ahead, Ryan. Right, thank you. Um, yes, thank you all for having me. This has been a lot of fun. And yeah, I would like to tell you about uh, new ideas for doing light shining through walls experiments, uh, specifically with RF technology, and and pushing that technology to look for heavier mass uh, hidden photons than than has been done before. Uh, this work is done at Fermilab with Asher Berlin and. Ronnie Harnick. So the idea here, the goal is to look for hidden photons. So first briefly, what, what are hidden photons? So this is a fairly simple uh, extension of the standard model. So we have, I have to use the band stick. We have, um, we have a, a Lagrangian here. So this piece here is, is familiar. This is just ordinary, uh, Maxwell theory, this is, a, this is a Maxwell massless vector coupled to electromagnetic charge, that's the J. And we want to add to this another abelian vector, which is massive. And then to have something interesting happen, we want this to couple to the standard model in some way. And a very nice, elegant way of doing that is through this kinetic mixing operator. So the, 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 the new field, the hidden field, doesn't directly interact with charges. But via this operator, it can mix into the regular photon, and which can give us an interesting dynamics. So this is a pretty standard, standard idea that's been around for for decades. Um, it will be useful to sort of switch back and forth between different bases, right? So we have uh, we have two fields here. We have our regular photon and our hidden photon. So we can always choose to think about this in terms of different linear combinations of those two fields. Uh, and we'll do whatever is most useful for us at, the, at any given, you know, problem. So this is a particularly useful basis. So the previous one I'll refer to as the kinetic mixing basis, and this one as the propagation basis. And the idea here is to make this particular transformation. And the point of doing that is it eliminates that kinetic mixing term. So now these two fields are propagation eigenstates. They don't mix with each other at all. And what happens when we make that transformation? So our Maxwell piece stays the same. Our hidden piece, now we have this again, this hidden massive field, but it now picks up a direct coupling two charges in this picture. So in this, in this picture, we sort of just have uh, two copies of electromagnetism. There's the regular one, and then there's this extra one, which is hidden in the sense that the coupling is suppressed by some small number epsilon, and it's massive. So these things could exist. So we should look for them. How would we do that? Can you understand why epsilon equals to one gives you this problem? Why epsilon gives you epsilon equals one gives you trouble? Because it's the whole thing that I made. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, there is there is a particular reason for this. Is there? I think that this. This transformation just isn't a sensible one in that limit. That if you go back here and take epsilon equal to one, I mean, what is there in the, yeah, exactly. you would want to just do a different transformation. I'm not sure. 
So the I reason there, I mean, it's. And then I guess the question is like, you know, whether if it's not equal to one, for instance, like, you know, if we have like a cell eigenvalue or something, yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, one more is not. Yeah, so this is what's happening. Okay, yeah. that makes yeah. sense. And if the diagonal starts to kind of get in bigger and bigger, then you will get one minus more. Yeah, yeah. okay. This makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so how would we how do we go about looking for this this uh, this new particle? How do we test if it exists? So if it's you know if the coupling was strong enough, um, and, you know you could see it in traditional particle physics experiments and, and colliders, and, and people do those searches. But uh, what I want to think about is the regime where suppose the mass of this hidden photon is quite light, you know, less than an eV, say, and the coupling is very small in which case you're not going to see this in colliders, but there are other techniques you can use. And a very good idea, which then goes back decades, is the idea of a light shining through walls experiment. And the, the basic idea here is you take some light source and produce as many photons as you can. You then filter those out with some opaque screen, you know, something that absorbs photons. And if you had no hidden photon in your universe, then this thing would block all the photons. And if you put a detector over here, you would see nothing, right? Light doesn't shine through walls normally. But if you now have this hidden photon in your theory, you have this process, as I've indicated it here, where you know in the mixing picture, with, by paying some price epsilon in your amplitude, a photon can mix into the hidden photon, which then, remember, doesn't interact with charges. So it goes through the wall. It also means it doesn't interact with the detector, but it could mix back, and then you would have a signal. So that's the process you're looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. Hidden photon is massless, then this process will also happen. If what is massless? If the hidden photon is massless, yes. then this process will also happen. Um, would this process occur? I think so, yes. But there's a, there's an important caveat that if it's massless, you can't actually tell the difference between it and the, the regular photon. Um, so I think, so in that case, in that sense, no, it would not occur. Um, yeah. yeah. There's one basis for you to write the interaction that it has an explicit hand in it. And, and rotate it away. Yeah. When n equals zero. It's no, yeah, yeah, there's there's a hidden M dependence to this this process. Results going to keep them. Results going to keep them. What can you do? It's out of the big one. Charge. It's going to keep them. So we get two U1s to big the circle. Yeah, that's like if so. If, things which are charged under the dark U one, then yeah, you can have a factor. Yeah, exactly. Or only thing charged under the normal U one. It's if the interaction is only coming from this kinetic mixing, yeah. then if it's massless, it it decouples. Yeah, but you could add explicit charges under it, and then you would get it. That is the linear combination dark coupling is no more, and you just call it for exactly. Yeah. yeah. Then, uh, yeah. then in that sense, there's no interaction between dark. Yeah. Mm hmm. So we can also think about this in the, the sort of propagation basis. And in this picture, what's happening is the electrons in your source, they directly couple to this hidden photon. So they can just produce it with some small probability. And then those hidden photons, they interact very weakly with the screen. So they're able to get through. And then with some small probability, they interact with your detector. So you have the same. The same physics happening in both both uh, uh, ways of thinking about it. So this is a, this is a good idea. The people are doing these experiments. Um, that doesn't necessarily imply that they will do them, but they are they are doing them. And there's sort of three main like categories. We can sort of classify the existing experiments and future experiments based on the source of the photons that's being used. So you have experiments in the radio where my source is some resonant cavity that I pumped full of radio photons. And I'm looking for these photons to mix and travel over and mix back and, and populate some other cavity that would normally be empty. 
These give you very, very nice bounds, a very nice reach, as, and, and they cut off at a particular mass. All the limits from these cut off at a mass around 10 to minus 5 EV, which corresponds to the energy of a radio photon, a gigahertz photon in, in the source cavity. If you want to go to higher masses, you can use optical sources, use a more energetic source. So people have done that as well with the ALPS experiments, and those push you up to like an EV. And then I classify these as light shining through walls experiments as well. You can also use the sun as a source, and you essentially look for uh, uh, X-ray photon in the center of the sun to mix into a hidden photon, travel all the way to the earth through some, you know, crust in the inner cavern where xenon-110 is, and then it can mix back and be absorbed in the detector. So those give you very strong bounds that go all the way up to masses corresponding to the temperature of the sun. So for the sun case, yeah. when people talk about this for axions, they don't really talk about it as like shining through walls because the production is like a pre metabolic process, right? Like, um, yeah, is the statement that for hidden photons, it really is the same thing because it's like mixing each other for the axion, it's kind of different because it's a hidden production. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess so. I mean, I guess the point there is it's really, um, I mean, but the Primakov is kind of like it's still like like you're you're bremming a photon that mixes into the axon, right? So I would kind still of, I mean, consider it usually for light shining through walls. I think I need a magnetic field for the axon. If I get universe in a magnetic field, it's yeah, not really what's happening. But that's that's correct yeah yeah i mean it's it's the magnetic field of the the coulomb potential that it scatters off of that plays that role i think but yeah i mean either way this is kind of playing word games yeah 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 in either case you're getting production of this particle in the sun and then you're shielding out the ordinary sunlight and detecting it on the other side i think for the hidden photon you're right that it's more directly analogous that you're just thermally Mixing. Um. Uh, so yeah, maybe we that one where so like you know you um focus on that one, right? Mm -hmm. so the difference is that in this class when you really have to think of some scale or something. So that's a big one. So yeah, so for the you could do but all the physics I'm gonna talk about would work just fine with an axion, except that you would need some background magnetic field to to, to contribute the mixing because it's a the, the the interaction is axion two photons. Okay. Uh, it's just it happens that the like the results are not nearly as impressive for the axion. Basically other constraints are much more significant. So you the technique I'm going to describe wins a lot more for hidden photons than other things. Uh, so that's why it's the focus. Okay good. So these are these are existing and, and future results. So and you see this structure that they all kind of, you know, segregate by energy scale that at roughly the energy scale of radio sources, these are the radio experiments and they, they cut off. Dark SRF is an important one to point out. This is an ongoing light shining through walls experiment using radio cavities at, at Fermi Lab, uh, which is, these are, these are the projected reaches and this is the like reach of their current kind of prototype experiment. And then you have a similar thing happening in optical and a similar thing with the solar bombs. And so the, the sort of the, the lore of these experiments that has been, been understood before is that you need this right hand wall here that's shutting off these constraints. This is a solid thing. This is a solid thing that you cannot move. And this is, this is the, the perspective I wanna to challenge today. Like, uh, yeah. the xenon one ton is um it's it's the xenon one ton dark matter detector and they're looking for if if the sun produced hidden photons they would um they could travel into xenon's you know box of xenon convert back into a regular photon these would be x-ray and be absorbed and, and there'd be a signal so this is just looking at their they can set this exclusion just from their data. Um, 
So why sun? Because sun is larger. Why not do the on Yeah, because the sun is much brighter, produces a lot more photons. Yeah. It's the photon champion of the solar system. Uh, yeah. For all the sources are there, like electrically and trying to absorb. So, is that, may I ask a question about? Uh, so, is it correct that all like people have a have a like prediction for a portion of the power of the source which is attributable to the dark force? Yeah. Even given the yeah, and, yeah, it's roughly epsilon squared. So they, like, they know the um, charge and the perhaps on the force. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's something you can you can compute. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. So it goes like epsilon to the fourth. It's a very small amount of power, uh, extra power that's emitted. So that's that's why this technique is useful. You want to like shield out all the regular E and M power, so you have sort of a zero background to look for this small amount of extra power. So if I understand well, the white the region, the allowed region yes. from the space, so you, you don't have any, any other astrophysical constraints in this model, because you know if there is such such light uh, photon, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the lifetime of the of the sun is smaller by action, you know, mm -hmm. but you have significant astrophysical constraints. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So there there are other constraints. Uh -huh. Um. Uh. I mean, I'm showing them all that fit on what's the plot that's shown here. Oh, okay. But like, so the the CMB. This is okay. This is the stone, but this I mean, that, that, solar, that, that solar cooling one is. Ah, it's this one. Okay. That, so I I I yeah I colored this such that things that could be understood as light shining through walls okay. are in the colors, and okay. the grays are other types of values. Okay. Yeah, but the the for the sun, the like sort of the light shining through walls is. Longer than the the, the cool things. Okay. Okay. Good. So, so the goal sorry, here. Well, yes. Yeah, sorry. As, as I perform this experiment, um, do you assume the dark was not dark? No. Uh, co correct. Cool. This this experiment yeah, is cool. agnostic to whether it could be dark matter or not. We're just interested. Does this exist in the Lagrangian? So, I mean, if these limits apply to dark matter, because if it was dark matter, you could still make it in the lab. But even if it's not dark matter, if it's just in the Lagrangian, it's cool. So if you include dark matter, then more constraints appear on yeah. the plot. Which will serve as noise or, or from one of these experts. Um, if dark, if, 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 even if, for, if it, well, I don't believe dark matter, believe by dark photon, if that's the case, then still we have dark photon here and there. Yeah, I don't so believe. So, because um, as we'll see, like this is a this is a resonant search where the drive is at one particular frequency, and so it's going to generate hidden photons regardless of their mass at that frequency, and so we tune the detector right to that frequency. So, if they also happen to be dark matter. <laughs> You would only have interference if the mass happens to align to a part in terms of the minus six. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're really like tuning in on the laboratory signal. Yeah. Yeah, so, so both our methods so we probably in a speed of light and dark photon in general they are massive, so there's a the difference. So it doesn't mean okay. that there's many dark photon in the universe. The light of the made are really high condition. The speed of light. Um, and the, the change in the speed is a function of its own and minus. Yeah, something like that. Oh, that like the the um, the propagation of a photon is not trivial anymore. So like that's I'm understanding you right. That's essentially what these CMB bounds are saying is that. As light propagates to us, it's going to mix into the hidden photon, which then has a different phase velocity. So that tells you that like different frequencies of CMB travel at different speeds to get to us. And that mixes, so you no longer see a like uh, uh, thermal spectrum. So you can be already on the that effect, yeah, yeah. Early, I mean, one phenomenon, one consequence of this would be that 
the C and B would now have wiggles in it. The, the, the spectrum would have wiggles that are, are not actually seen. So that's what that limit is. Yeah. Okay, so the the goal of this talk is to really to focus this 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 sort of open space here and to try to push this line over, right? This line is a real bummer, in part because these limits are these limits are so strong, right? That just slightly over here, you have no constraint from this technology. And so why is that line there? Uh, the basic lore is that this is a solid, you know, this is some concrete constraint that you can't really move, and it's coming just from kinematics. That if yeah, yeah, this the this dotted is future experiments, experiments that are underway. Um, I mean, these are both like funded things that are happening and taking data now. Yeah, yeah, and then the colored ones are existing limits. And the basic idea here is just you know your intuition from particle colliders or, or whatever that you know you're producing these hidden photons and so if they have a mass you need to have enough energy in your source to be bigger than that mass to produce them um, and so if you have a radio cavity you're not going to be producing things that are much more massive than radio energy uh, but that's a little too quick uh, we know for example that that's not quite true right in particle physics all the time we produce you know virtual particles who have energies possibly much less than their mass um, produce is maybe not the right word but we see their effects very clearly and so something like this should certainly be possible that we can produce like a virtual hidden photon from this source even if it's very massive and get some effect from that so the way i like to think about this uh even though, as Sarif mentioned, I'm part of the SQMS collaboration. In my heart, I'm a classical guy. And so I like to think about this in, in classical language. If we take a, a, you know, a wave equation, here's just a dispersive classical wave equation, the same equation that the hidden photon field will obey. This equation has a particle-like dispersion. And if we drive a signal at a frequency omega much bigger than the mass. This looks like you know, a massless or approximately massless waves. But we know that this solution works even if the frequency is much less than the mass, right? This solution, this plane wave works for any K that obeys this. And if we take omega to be much less than the mass, then K is valid, it's just imaginary. And then this becomes instead of an oscillatory solution, an exponential solution. So these are what are called evanescent modes, and we're familiar with them from, you know, they show up all over optics and, and acoustics. And this is the same math as quantum tunneling, right? So if the mass of, of our of our hidden photon is much, much bigger than the source, then we will still be able to produce hidden photon modes you know disturbances in the hidden photon field they'll just be exponentially decaying modes instead of uh, propagating modes and you might think you know so what like how does that really help if if these things are decaying over some very short length scale doesn't that you know mean that we need to now bring our detector that close to the source like compress this whole experiment that's not really very feasible and the key point that I want to convince you of is that no, you don't need to do that. So here's a good way to, to, to sort of think about it in a cartoon level. If we are now in a um, evanescent regime where the, the, the mass of the, the hidden photon is much bigger than the frequency, then I should think of each of these you know, propagations as coming along with some evanescent suppression factor where D is just the distance the hidden photon has propagated. And when I think about it in this basis, we can ask, how far does the hidden photon actually have to propagate in real space in order to produce a signal, right? It doesn't have to go from here all the way here. It only has to go across the barrier. So the real length scale that's going to set the like exponential suppression 
is the thickness of the barrier. Right. Uh, so you also have this side middle, right? In the first expression, you also have this side middle. Yeah, and, like the amplitude. Yeah, the amplitude of the dash photon or this one photon. And I, you don't have any separation data. I mean, if the, there's a mismatch between the frequency and the mass, I understand that if you probably um, have the part of the explanation is suppressed, but. You do, you do, yeah. Like when we do the calculation for real, there's Maybe. additional, like, exactly. There's yeah. additional power law factors in that. It's not exponential. Yeah, not exponential. Like another one that shows up here is if if this distance, if the you know, source, the detector distance is really long and the thickness of the barrier is really small and the range of this dark photon, one over M, is just a little bit bigger than the barrier. Then we sort of lose out on all of the possible conversions that happen on the way. And you're only sensitive to the conversions that happen like right here and then right here. So there's sort of a volume suppression that you get there from. So there's various suppressions of M that show up, but the key th point is the only exponential suppression that will appear on this thickness of the barrier. Yeah. And effectively all the previous experiments I've talked about Effectively thick barrier experiments. They're experienced where the barrier is, is very large compared to the frequency uh, to the wavelength of the light being used. So those experiments, as soon as you hit the evanescent regime, they just shut off. Is there did you have a question or no definitely what for the sound what you what because you like you now now you can let me say you write exactly you write equation. How do you parameterize the wall? I mean how dark is the world? Because it has some dielectric uh, properties, right? Yeah, Which, good. So I'll get so, to I mean, uh, what is uh, the parameters of the world? Yeah, so the wall that we're envision is a uh, superconductor. Okay. And so there is a, the, like, the darkness of the wall is there's some finite penetration depth of real photons. Yes. Into the wall. And so, so the, the electric, let me say, the content of this wall. I mean, if I'm uh, what? Um, I don't know, but the dielectric uh, constant of the superconductor is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the, I mean, the, the way of the wave, you have to, uh, you have to know the. Yeah, you know, the way we play. treat it is the, um, like, uh, we treat it as like a finite conductor with some finite penetration depth. Uh, it's conductor. Yeah, conductor. It's a conductor. Yeah, yeah. Oh. How can you think about this in terms of the propagation? Yes, very good question. So, right, the, we, they, it's time for two things, right? The propagation basis, because in the propagation basis, it seems like we are indeed propagating from here all the way to here, right? But there's a subtlety you're missing in that picture, which is that in the propagation basis, when the fields encounter this barrier, something interesting will happen. So we'll see that now. And also, yeah, it's time for some math. So let's be serious physicists and let's do some math. Right. Can I ask this one question related to the previous picture? Yeah. Is, if you want, you really want the conversion here to happen like right before and right after the place. Yes. Right. Could you do something like put like dielectrics there to try to get some like resolute conversion, get the like plasma mass of the photon to match the probably yeah I haven't seen this one that's the one thing that yeah I'm saying, like saying add outside like add uh, uh, so a layer on top of possibly that. yeah I possibly know. I hadn't really thought I mean it is true that we like I mean a, a simpler version of that is you do better by like making these as close to the wall as you can like so we sort of yeah. try to minimize that wasted space but yeah that's a good point Okay, good. So let's be serious, but not too serious. Okay, this is a toy, a toy model. This is a question I want to ask. Suppose we have a like a sheet of current, right? A nice simple toy model. We have a, a planar AC sheet current. We know what would happen in ordinary ENM. This would radiate some plane wave. And now let's put our wall here. Let's take a conducting sheet. Uh, infinitely thin perfect conductor right here we know what would happen in e and m if this if there's a current k here 
a screening current would appear whose magnitude is also k. And it would screen out any fields from appearing back there. Right? This is how a mirror works. And so I want to ask, how does this change? How does this change if we add a hidden photon? Do we get some field over here if we add a hidden photon? And particularly, let's add a very um, evanescent hidden photon. So let's add a hidden photon whose mass is way bigger than, than this frequency. And one over the mass is way smaller than this distance and also the distance to where we will put our light detector, electric field sensor. So we can work through this. We need the field equations. So we can get those most easily from the, uh, the Lagrangian in the propagation basis, because then, then the two fields just a couple. And so we have ordinary Maxwell, and this gives us Maxwell's equations here in blue. And then we have the Crocker Lagrangian here, and this gives us a massive version of Maxwell's equations. They look exactly the same, except with the mass. And our coupling to photons is now coupling to charges is suppressed by epsilon. So this is sort of half of Maxwell's equation, or not half of Maxwell's equation, this is half of BNM, right? We have how this is telling us how the fields respond to charges. We need the other part as well. So the Lorentz force follows just from this coupling of current to, to field. But we notice that we have the exact same structure over here. So really the current couples to A plus epsilon A plus, couples to that combination. So from that, it follows that the Lorentz force is gonna look like this. The Lorentz force has the ordinary form. It just couples to these particular linear combinations. It will also follow from there that conducting boundary conditions, like how the conductor, um, what demands does a conductor make on the field, they apply to this linear combination. Okay, so don't want to make things too, you know, complicated. But this just cries out for me. You can't just let this linear combination sit there without giving it a special name. We have we have that this particular combination is the thing that applies forces to a charge. And it would follow that the orthogonal linear combination doesn't apply a force. Like if you have fields existing in the orthogonal combination, charges don't care. They don't, they don't respond to it. So it will be useful to give these things names, the visible field, which is this combination, and the invisible field, which is that combination. And we can write everything in terms of the visible and invisible fields. And then our interactions with charges and conductors are very simple. The visible field just behaves like an ordinary Maxwell field, but now your field equations are coupled together, right? These, these visible and invisibles are not propagation eigenstates. So your field equations are coupled. They would mix into each other when they propagate in free space. So these will be, be handy for us to have. So now let's solve this, this toy model. What are the fields produced by a current? Uh, a sheet current, well, we get now think of the propagation field and the propagation basis. Um, this thing just sources both types of fields, the, the massless one and the massive one. So the massless one is the ordinary thing. We get some plane wave that propagates that way. And then for the primed massive field, we get, you know, just go back and solve it to get these, these very pretty factors, but you get a um, evanescent mode, right? Hey, we're taking the approximation that M is really big to so get some decaying evanescent molecule. So these fields are going to impinge upon the conductor over here. And what's going to happen? The conductor will demand that this visible linear combination go to zero at a certain point. Right? The conductor will generate some screening current and demand that this goes to zero. The only way it can do that is by adjusting the value of the screening current, which will produce its own E and E prime fields that cancel out these on the surface. And the important point is that the conductor doesn't care about E or E prime individually, separately. It only cares about this linear combination. Let me ask a very simple and very nice question because I'm a little bit confused with the right? Uh, if you write down massive electrodynamics, 
as you do. For example, the gas law does not uh, does not uh, apply anymore. Right. Uh, so okay, I'm gonna look, but uh, in order, to, let me say to to to, to apply the usual as you do maybe boundary conditions ah. in the usual little dynamics. This is not maybe I don't know how big it is. Yeah. Uh huh. So you could go through the like um to the question these like I mean even the in the conductor you say the electricity is zero right. Mm -hmm. This is this I can understand in electrodynamics because the goes this is really a result of the Gauss law mm -hmm, mm -hmm. inside the conductor, right? Yeah, yeah. So okay, there is no way to have an electric field. Yeah, so you if can... the Gauss law does not apply this, I don't know how. I mean, maybe this is not zero. Maybe it's different from zero. Good, you're right. It's 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 not obvious, but but this is the right thing. So you can go through. The exercise of like you get Maxwell's equations and you analyze them like in infinitesimal surfaces around a boundary. Okay. Like you will still get from maybe maybe the answer is in the previous pre uh, transparency. You had I mean you wrote that okay, it's a mandatory constraint. This thing, this oh yeah. The, maybe this is left, but I think but you is. you you force this to because this is the gate fixing. Yeah, yeah. So and from this, you can maybe you can get something similar, similar to the Gauss law. You do so, yeah. When you you can break this up into like the, the vector component equations, like Maxwell's equations. Yeah. You do get you get something that similar to Gauss's law, but it has an extra term in it that makes it different than Gauss's law. Yes. So you can then you can still use it in because the same the way. The situation at the end of the day is that the time the time derivative of the, of the vector potential. Plus the d of a equals to zero. If 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 you are in the stuff limit, let's say the first is zero and then the other is zero. Okay, I don't know how you play this game. Just because I I just want want to understand how you take you get the boundary conditions. I think the answer to your question is that d parallel equals to zero. Yeah. That doesn't come from Gauss's law. That comes from Faraday's law. Uh, it is related to this gauge fixing law. Uh, yeah, no, no. Well, well I mean, I mean, you need to use this to get Faraday. Yeah, law yeah. From here, yeah. Yes. And this, this is actually not a like something interesting about this case is you don't you don't have the gauge redundancy when you have the mass. Mm -hmm. So when you work out the field equations from here, like this isn't a choice. This is something that yeah, just has to be okay. satisfied. Okay, okay. But Faraday's law still applies even in the massive. You're right, you're right. Yeah, so it's watching more mm -hmm. That's okay. that is right. Yeah, yeah, that is right. Uh, I think Faraday is coming from the outside. That's right. Yeah. Okay, good. So the, the conductor, conductor tries to zoom. Uh, to enforce this boundary condition, this condition that the visible field goes to zero. So what we want to ask is we want to compute this screening current. We want to ask what is the visible field impinging on here? And in this case that they're far separated, the visible field not only has components from both the massless and the massive fields, the massive component is going to die off long before it reaches here. So what's hitting here is essentially just this massless plane wave component. But when the conductor goes to screen it, it's going to generate both components. It's going to generate the massless E and the massive E prime. It doesn't have a choice. They both couple to the current. It generates both of them. And so the current right here at the surface, or excuse me, the field right here at the surface, you know, which is within the like fall off length, the, the one over M. So we don't have the exponential suppression. Looks like this. You have a contribution from E, a contribution from E prime. And so it follows that for this to cancel this, KS can't equal K in magnitude. It has to be slightly smaller. So you find that the screening current, the screening current that you need to satisfy boundary conditions is slightly smaller 
than the source curve. They don't match up perfectly anymore. And that means if you now step far away over here and ask what field you observe, if I'm sufficiently far away, I'm not going to get any of the massive components reaching me. The visible field that I see far away is just the plane wave component from here and the massive plane wave from here. And if epsilon was zero, these things would be equal and, and equal and opposite and cancel, but they no longer cancel now in this picture or in this scenario. They no longer cancel and the sort of degree, the, the amount that's left over scale is like epsilon squared. So you have this mass, the, the massive mode, the evanescent mode gets the participate in screening here, but it drops out over here and that spoils the screening over here. And so you have some visible field that remains at some far distance away. And you can sort of see from this picture that like as I make these distances very, very far, nothing is gonna change here, right? This is the limit of far separations. So there's no suppression coming from this long distance. Okay, good. So let me, in the interest of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is why there's no exponential suppression showing up in at all over here. So what is sort of happening here on a higher level? And so, so you know, in the, this propagation picture, what is happening? The, the physics here, the sort of fundamental physics that's happening is the same as in neutrino mixing or any sort of mixing. What's different is we don't have the oscillatory nature of the mixing. Instead, it's an exponential type behavior. So what happens is we generate some visible field. The visible field is not a propagation eigenstate. So as it propagates towards the shield, it mixes into some admixture of visible and invisible. If it was a neutrino and it kept on going, it would eventually mix back, right? But we don't get that. This is not, that that's what's different here. This mixing is sort of a one-way process. It's, it looks just like you've taken the, like, the trig functions in neutrino mixing formulas and replace them with hyperbolic functions. It's the same sort of behavior. When you get to the shield, what does the shield do? The shield shuts off the visible component but it allows the invisible to pass through. Then you would normally not be able to detect the invisible, but it's not a propagation eigenstate. So as it propagates, it mixes back into some visible component. And that's what you detect. So that basic structure is the exact same thing that happens in other, other mixing processes. The difference here is we just have this exponential sort of behavior as opposed to oscillatory behavior. But so let's uh remedy this fact that we've taken the wall to be really thin. What happens if the wall is thick? That's, that's not an approximation we can get away with because we want to think about, you know, building an experiment that probes really, really high masses. And as we consider bigger and bigger masses, eventually the range one over M would resolve the size of the wall. So we need to, we need to think about what happens if one over M is smaller than the wall thickness. And this is fairly straightforward to understand. Again, the, the basic picture is we would have impinging on our wall some visible and invisible uh, components of the field. And we want to ask what, what field components propagate inside the conducting barrier. And that's straightforward to, to, to solve. The, what does the conductor do if it's an ideal conductor? It shuts off the visible component just sort of zeros it out. So there's no, we don't have two propagating modes inside the conductor, we only have one. And if we go back to our field equations for the visible and invisible pieces, there, you know, this coupled thing in free space, but in a conductor, the visible components are shorted out and now they're simply solved. You see that inside the conductor, the invisible is a propagation eigenstate and it just has some mass. So what happens here is this guy, this guy will be shut off. This guy will be allowed to come inside. And then it's going to propagate just as an evanescent, perfect evanescent mode inside. So it will be decaying exponentially. And so when it leaves the other side, 
and now it's amplitude is suppressed, and now it's going to mix back into the visible, just like before, which inherits the suppression. And you can actually go through it. You can do this exactly, and you can get you see this exponential suppression up here in the barrier thickness, just like what you would have guessed would happen. Okay. So this is the this is the basic basic physics. So now let's think about how we would turn this into an experiment. So this is the experiment that uh, that we proposed. We're going to do a radio frequency cavity type experiment, but we're now going to place the cavities as close together as possible with that thin superconducting barrier in between. We'll drive this with as much power as we can manage. And we'll look for a signal to appear over here due to evanescent modes crossing the barrier. So there's a couple sort of practical concerns we should address. The first is how high of masses can we reach with this technique, right? How high of masses can we get to? That's equivalent to saying how thin of a barrier can we tolerate, right? So there's you know, challenges with a thin barrier. There's a fundamental issue, which is that the visible field is not shut off instantaneously on the surface. There is some penetration depth. And so what we want is that the barrier is thick enough to shield out all of the visible components, or at least much more of it than, than, we, than our signal. Um, so we're going to think about a superconducting barrier. So the penetration depth in the superconductor is called the London depth. And so the condition we have, the sort of minimal condition on the thickness, is that the suppression from the London depth, we want that to be much stronger than the expected size of the signal. Uh, and so here we're, we're saved by two things. One, even though we're going to probe epsilons that are very, very small, this is exponential. So we don't need that many London depths of material to get strong suppression. And two, the lung depth of the superconductor happens to be very small. So if we apply this condition, we find that for the epsilons that we can reach, we need about 50 London depths, which corresponds to about three microns of material. So that's not much material at all. And three microns corresponds to a mass of close to 0.1 B, which is about four orders of magnitude improvement over the existing thick walled experiments. Uh, in this in this necessary uh, 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 equation I mean, that you still you 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 want to have the mass 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 be the length and length right the mass of the of the photon right or not? Um, I mean this is the, no so D is uh must be the length and length to the minus one length potentially. The, the other way around. That's the that's the case that'll be suppressed. Ah. So m much less than one over d okay. is what we will be able. To, what where we'll have this like. Ah. So we want d to be as small as possible to push our boundary up. But if it's too small, there's going to be. So this is upper bound. So this is upper bound of the mass we can make okay. call. That's right. Okay. So there's other sort of. Practical concerns. Um, one is that a thin barrier doesn't conduct heat very well. So there's going to be, there's a conductor right here. There, there's still some ohmic heating due to this field right next to the conductor. That heat needs to get out to the outside of the system where there's going to be you know, liquid helium to cool it. And since that heat has to flow through a thin barrier, the temperature in here is going to be hotter than the temperature here. And we can't let that get too hot to spoil superconductivity. That that will limit limit things. You could also be concerned about it's a flimsy little thing, and there's a lot of electromagnetic power there. Will the radiation pressure like start flapping it around and break it? So one basic solution to both of these, for one, is they don't. Um, these are not really concerns for sort of medium-sized barriers, barriers of order like 0.1 millimeter or so, which still gives us an interesting experiment. But if we want to push to the fundamental limit, we can need to solve these problems. One approach is to add a substrate here 
The idea is to make the barrier mechanically and thermally thick, but not electrically thick. So we can put a dielectric here, which doesn't screen fields, but it will allow heat flow. It will provide stability. And then we plate onto it a thin layer of superconducting to do the actual screen. Um, and plating superconductors onto dielectrics, that's an established technology. You know, this would have the trade off that the acute quality factor over here gets hurt by the sapphire, but that's the trade off that you just live with. And then there's other more sort of exotic ways of possibly getting around this. So let me quickly go through how we calculate the signal for real in this experiment. Um, something interesting that we, we ran into is that, you know, the, the Calculational formalisms that previous experiments have used, uh, they do include the evanescent modes. Like so, we normally we can just take those formalisms and apply it to our setup. Uh, the evanescent modes are included just by default, right? When we solve Maxwell's equations, that they're just they're there. Um, the thing that was missing in previous experiments was not the, the formalism, but that. The geometry had a thick wall, so that you know, squashed that signal. But we actually found it an interesting effect when you apply those formalisms in the evanescent limit, they become very unwieldy, and there's like some not intuitive cancellations that happen that make it very surprising. So we had to, we developed a different way of going about the calculation that sort of makes the, the qualitative behavior in the evanescent case very transparent. So let me just briefly run through that. The idea is to say, uh, start kind of work backwards. So we have some receiver cavity. And next to it is going to be some emitter cavity, which is driven. With field. So there's some field inside here, and there's currents flowing on the walls. We ask, well, what signal appears in here? That signal is governed by this equation. This is just follows from those previous field equations that I've written down. This looks like just the ordinary wave equation for the visible field with this additional term in it. So we can identify this term as like an effective current. And then the, the, the physics of what does a current, how does a current inside of a cavity generate cavity modes? That's a well understood thing. We can apply that understanding. We just need to figure out what this effective current is. Effective current is given by the A prime field that's generated, sourced by this cavity. So we ask what sort of A prime does this emitter source over here? And then we use that to do this calculation. So how do we get that A prime field? This is where we differ from previous, previous uh, work. The A prime field, we're working in the propagation basis where A prime is sourced by electromagnetic currents. So we can get the A prime field by just integrating the Green's function of the currents on the surface here. So we do some surface integral over the emitter cavity to get the A prime field. And this integral in the evanescent limit is actually very easy to just, just estimate because the propagator in the Green's function is this exponential suppression. So if I wanna ask like, what is the current here? Yeah, what is the effective current here? The only part of the integral that really contributes is this closest piece right here. So that simplifies the integral. And we get this nice result that the A prime field and equivalently the effective current that lives over here always tracks. It just mirrors the structure of the real honest to God electron current on the other side of the wall. So it has the exact same shape, same direction. And it always follows parallel to the, to the surface which is an important detail when it comes to actually <clears throat> designing this experiment. So the calculation on this slide is in the propagation basis, but mm -hmm. on the previous slide, yeah. it would have been in the like... We're kind of mixing in, in a way that sh should make you uncomfortable, but it, it's okay. Basically like this, the point is that the, the visible, uh, 
the, I guess it's like you only care about state prime and order at or something. There's something, order yeah, or yeah. So you can that's right. That there, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's also the fact that it's like this is just a source for the visible field. So it's just the fact that the the propagation field sources the visible field. You could write this in terms of visible and invisible, and then you have extra epsilon, but So this is an exact calculation of that. This is just looking at the white here is the emitter cavity. This is the longitudinal direction. This is the radial direction. And for two different structures of modes inside the emitter, this is the structure of effective currents that you get outside. And the point here is just that, again, the directions here are always perpendicular parallel to this, to this surface. Okay, so is the geometry here like there two separate cylinders? Uh, so this is this is just looking at one emitter and then the same emitter in a different mode, and then we could place a detector anywhere you want around here. Oh, oh, you would place a detector anywhere you want, and then pick the mode structure that aligns with J effective best for where you placed it. So we would naively like the setup we imagine is placing another cavity right here. Okay, so let me just kind of skip through this. Once we have J effective, we can now compute what the signal will be rung up in the, in the detector cavity. So from there we can get parametrically what is the expected signal in terms of cavity geometry parameters and the physics, fundamental physics parameters as well. So a couple of interesting things is we do have some power loss suppressions in amp. So as we go to higher amp, this does get, get worse and in a power flaw fashion. And then what's also interesting if you're familiar with cavity experiments is this doesn't scale with the volume. Usually these things scale proportional to the volume. Now we have this more complicated shape of amp. So fixed volume, we do better if the cavities are more So we imagine doing this experiment in kind of three stages. So this is a picture of the dark SRF experiment that's ongoing right now. Here's emitter and source. Maybe this is emitter and this is source, I don't remember. But the wall in this case is this like 10 centimeter gap in between. So we would imagine doing this experiment, but instead moving these cavities really close to each other. And we're gonna kind of consider sort of three qualitative stages. The first is what can we do with like existing cavities that you would find in the closets, in the lab doing this experiment um, with a fairly thick wall that's you know, thin enough to do something interesting, but not so challenging to work with. Now this experiment is ongoing and they plan, you know, they project to make a lot of improvements to their readout technology, their, um, their cavities. So we can imagine just pig piggybacking off of that, like. How much better would we do if we did this again using their like projected improved setups? And then, you know, the ultimate is to take that projected improvements and optimize it specifically for the thin wall cake. So take a pancake geometry, take a thin wall, imagine we solve whatever problems we need. This would be sort of the best limit we could, could conceive of. And this is what we do. So the sort of current, um, Current technology will allow us to, to reach this little bit of, of space here. So this is that same plot I showed before where this is the dark SRF projection. These are the solar limits. I've just zoomed in on that triangle. If we take all of dark SRF's uh, improvements, can consider adding those, we can push all the way down here. And it's not surprising that they sort of line up here, right? We're taking the same basic parameters. But this allows us to kind of just fill in this space. And then if we consider the like very thin wall pancake cavity, that the pancakeness pushes the resonant frequency over. So it peaks over here, and then we can push the ball off over. Yeah. All the way up to near point one. Um, 
Okay. So let me wrap up. So I'm just let me just say briefly, the idea here is that uh, that the the mass reach in a light shining through walls experiment is fundamentally given by the barrier thickness. Um, and so we can take advantage of that by using very thin electrically, you know, solid barriers. We can use radio frequency uh, technology to push these experiments to much higher masses where they significantly outperform the optical experiments and give us the best reach for any terrestrial experiment up to about 0.1 EV, masses of 0.1 EV. And then I you know, went over this part rather quickly because it's kind of technical, but we've also worked out like the, uh, the best formalism for calculating these to really characterize sort of the qualitative features of these signals, which are a little different than other light shining through walls signals. So you have to make some you know, specific design choices to really optimize this, this properly. And then this, this work is um, under development by the dark SRF folks for, uh, for, for future work in their, their um, experiment. So, thank you. Do you have any more questions for that? Yeah. 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 Um, that's above my pay grade. No, I don't know. It's a small scale experiment, yeah. like a yeah. few million, I would think. Yeah. Like this is, you know, you need to build these cavities, but a lot of them are already built and, yeah. and, and laying around. Um, I think running the like cooling is probably the most expensive part, like keeping yeah. this. Yeah, keeping all of this surface cool down to a few Kelvin temperatures. Um, I think that's probably the biggest expense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In this uh, in this uh, region of the parameter state, how this, let's say, competes with other experiments? Yeah, so um, the only other planned experiment in this space is, this is way up here, this Alps 2. Uh, and so we're uh, uh, we're, we're uh, talking uh, off about right there. Just, uh, yeah. Some other experiments I think we have to remember. Some qubits, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. Even in this region for um I'm not familiar. I'm familiar with some like more well, Roy or some some things. Some yeah. like dark matter experiments yeah. using uh, qubits where the dark matter yeah, yeah. excites um I mean, I, I don't know what masses those are. They're, yes, they're, they're more to like EV masses, I think. I, I look on more papers. Uh -huh. But I, I mean, I believe those are also dark matter specific mm -hmm. limits where this this would be more general. Okay. Oh, okay. Here you're not plotting any dark matter. I'm not plotting any dark matter when oh. yeah, this is strictly just does this exist? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but. It's, if you added dark matter experiments, then you'd probably have all the cavity they would go. Oh, this is a good point. Yeah, yeah. If you add dark matter experiments, um, like things like bread, and if you're familiar with the experiment bread, they're a big, like, big optical dish where, like, hidden photon dark matter can convert and reflect off the dish and be focused on the little detector. They push down below. Uh, they push down here in similar mass range. I see. So they're much better, but that that's specifically assuming it's dark matter, and they have a great big dish to collect a lot of dark matter and focus it down. Well, yeah. So, so, so that are more expensive experiments too, actually. Yeah, that's a really big experiment. Yeah. Yeah. If it's dark matter, then you can use that to your advantage to design a more uh, string, no, more sensitive experiment. I think that's just generally true. Of dark matter searches versus a new particle search. Have you guys talked at all that helps too about how they might be able to implement it? Um, yeah, I haven't talked to them about it. No, I haven't. I mean, what it would what it would do is it would take this from a straight line to some thing like that. Which is already ruled out, yeah. but it would be 
Um, I don't know if it's harder as well to get. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, but how to like, well, I can just without, no? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. There are like, there are already. Yeah. Already, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's going though. To to be fair, like the the uh, else two does much better relative to these other experiments than the search for axions. That's oh. not really what it's designed for because there you get an enhancement due to the like magnetic field that they apply. So they're not great for hidden photons, but that's they shouldn't be judged just on that. It's really an it's really an axion experiment. But it's based on full axion. <laughs> a, a, so I, I don't know the historical development, but in their like <laughs> in their latest, like their latest documentation, they say A stands for any. It's the any light particle search. Oh, uh, okay. but, but, so I guess actually in, in that case, or even for you guys, if you wanted to do an axion version, uh, mm -hmm. like if you want to turn on a magnetic field, big magnetic field, you can't use superconductors, right? Yeah, the best axion version that I could think of would be, there are, there's a, an axion search idea by, um, Ronnie Harnick and Christina Gao. That's you don't have a background magnetic field. Instead, you take two cavities and you drive two different modes oh, in the emitter. Right. And those two modes have an E dot B. So they can source an axion, which would then mix in the you then would also drive a mode in the detector and it mixes into a fourth mode. Okay. So you could do that sort of search. In that case, you could do that with a thin ball and it would improve. Um, in that case, the limits are only a little bit better than solar cooling limits anyway. And this kind of buys you just a small little corner of the parameter space. So it's, I mean, most impressive here that you could do it with that sort of search too. Hey, so I was going to ask if Alf wanted to put a thin wall, but still use a magnetic field. Oh, it's like the shortest penetration depth you can get with not a super thin. I don't know, but they could also make it. They could use a super conductor because, well, no, I think wanted no, they near need, the ball, right? yeah, it needs to be very near the ball. So that would yeah. be. I think they also there's a problem in that the. the here we have an advantage. There's a big hierarchy in that we can get a wall that's much smaller than the wavelength. Like, they can there your wavelengths are like micron size. Oh, um, yeah. So sort of as soon as you go to the evanescent limit, you're already at the like thickness of the walls. Yeah. So I don't think it, I don't think you can make walls much thinner than that, and then it really doesn't buy you that much. Like here, we're able to move the cutoff orders of magnitude, and you're going to move the cutoff less. So does this normal thing? Does it also depend on the frequency of the photon that you're shooting? Because that's similar to how you're shooting in a higher frequency photon. Yeah, yeah, the penetration depth depends yeah. on frequency. Yeah, I'm not sure what the like optical. Maybe. I think it's more complicated. It's more complicated because I know that like in radio, lower frequencies can penetrate better in some. That's why like governments use these extremely low frequency emitters to communicate the submarines. Because really low frequency penetrates seawater, but typical radio frequency. Yeah, but I agree thinking that you know, in the case, there's also the next signal which does the main Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't I, I'm not sure. Okay. Are there no more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. And we will be going to the next time. So, I'm happy. Yeah, just leaving.
Sixth is great. Yeah. Um, I do kind of want to go to Tea House again. So I, I went to Tea House last night. I wasn't informed that Tea House was the dinner spot. But I, yeah, it is. I would like to try a lot more things than I ate by myself. So. Thank you. Thank you.